It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Change makers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. Our bodies are built to respond to stress, but it's easy to forget about your innate power when you're facing challenges. According to today's guest, Dr. Christy Gibson, it's possible to remodel your brain to achieve post-traumatic growth. She joins us today to explain how to embrace your power and tap into your wisdom. Dr. Gibson is a physician, change agent, and trauma clinician. She's the author of the book, The Modern Trauma Toolkit, Nurture Your Post-Traumatic Growth with Personalized Solutions. Welcome, Dr. Gibson. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me, Joan. I'm really happy to be here. Doctor, I want to begin by defining trauma. You often hear people say it was such a trauma. Is trauma something that actually happens or is it our response to something that happened? You've got it exactly right, Joan. So we do speak about traumatic events and kind of use it as an adjective to describe something that has happened to us that's been very uncomfortable. So, I mean, when I was Looking at your story, you, you've had some significant traumatic events when you lost family members. And, mm-hmm. you know, I have recently, too. I, I think those events can be incredibly traumatic. And we talk about grief, but we don't necessarily recognize that as a traumatic event. But when it comes to clinical trauma, that is the response that happens in our nervous system. And so people can go through the exact same traumatic event and have very different responses to that event based on our innate resilience in terms of the kinds of experiences we had as a child, our genetics, the kinds of coping strategies we've developed over our lifetimes. There's many reasons why some people might experience trauma long after the event has passed. It gets locked in our nervous system, and it doesn't happen to everybody. Mm -hmm. And so that's why one person, like you mentioned my story, sometimes I wonder how I even got through all of that, you know, because I used to say to myself, any one of these things would derail a person. So how did I get through all of them at once? So as you're saying, it's basically the way that we are programmed in our subconscious. Yes. And I love that you mentioned subconscious because a lot of that, when we're, when we're just trying to get through something, um, we're not consciously trying to program our nervous system one way or the other. It's really just getting through using that sympathetic nervous system fight and flight to get to the other side of it, where we finally are able to be calm and in our parasympathetic nervous system again. And for some people, one of those responses gets locked in. So sometimes people get locked into a sympathetic overwhelm, and sometimes people get locked into a parasympathetic overwhelm. And even though those nervous system responses help us in those moments and they can be um, really important to our day-to-day coping, when those systems are just overactivated, that's when we are left with those very uncomfortable post-traumatic stress symptoms and and sometimes full-blown PTSD. Mm -hmm. So if we're stuck in that physical response of the stress, anxiety, fear cycle, how do we break that? And that's exactly why I wrote the book. I I joined TikTok Um, right at the beginning of the pandemic. There was a young person in my life who said, you know, you explain mental health so differently than a lot of other people that I've heard. And a lot of my experience as a family physician for 20 years and then learning all of the different trauma modalities, um, I've worked in very um, priority populations. So lots of immigrants and refugees, uh, lots of people with very low levels of education. And so I've gotten used to learning how to explain very complex subjects in a simple way. And so I joined TikTok for that purpose because she said, you know, 
people are really struggling right now. The pandemic is hitting young people hard. And my goal was to try to say, there are so many ways to shift your nervous system and to come out of these traumatic responses. And so I was teaching body-based or somatic tools online. I was describing different cognitive tools that you can try. So, you know, just this week we, we talked about what's it like to have the movie of your trauma playing in your head or what does it feel like in your body when it's like you have your foot on the brake and the accelerator at the same time. So when people can relate to those kinds of ideas, they're really engaged in learning how to make those shifts. And that's how the book came about is I just thought these are really practical tools that I know. They're very easy to explain and people can change the way that their brain is responding, the way their nervous system is responding, almost like a do-it-yourself tool. But then the other important thing for me is where is the trauma coming from? And a lot of it has systemic causes. So a large part of what I address both on TikTok and in the book is what do we do at the community level to stop these traumatic events from happening? And I think that's equally important to addressing it at the individual level. You just mentioned the movie of trauma, and I love that description. I always described it to myself as the story I tell myself, but that's where we get stuck, playing that movie over and over again, and we keep encoring it, and we're stuck in that. But now you mentioned the community trauma. So when you have this story that you're playing over and over, and then you add in the repetitive information and and the trauma that keeps coming at, at us from that external, how do we overcome the internal and the external. You've exactly hit it. I think a lot of existing therapies will address one or the other. And I really think it's important to um, take an approach where you recognize what's the most available doorway to you. And after a significant trauma, the doorway that's best accessible is often the body. And when we go to therapy, they try to get us to change our thoughts. And sometimes those aren't available. So what, as you describe the story is playing itself out over and over again, that's because it's congruent with the stuck part of your nervous system. So changing your body's response first often makes those cognitive or brain-based therapies more available to a person. So that's why I call the book a toolkit is because I think it's really important to individualize the ways that you're going to shift, not every system is going to respond to the same things at the same time. Some people really prefer to use their brain and to try to use tools like cognitive behavior therapy, motivational interviewing. There's some beautiful new tools like NARM or the neuroaffective relational model for childhood trauma or developmental trauma. Absolutely remarkable. But for some people to get there, they really need to get their nervous system in line because when your amygdalas or the part of your brain that is creating the trauma responses, when those are locked on and your nervous system is in that overactive or underactive mode, your thinking brain actually goes offline. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people will describe to me, I just can't concentrate, my memory's shot, I feel like I'm in a brain fog. And there can certainly be physical causes of those symptoms. But for people with trauma, the trauma itself can actually shut off the thinking brain. And it's remarkable when I'm working with patients, you know, after a couple of months, their thinking brain comes back online. I've heard so many people say, I feel like I'm coming out of that fog. Mm -hmm. And that's when I know that the thinking brain therapies are more available to them. Is that why sometimes, doctor, when, when a person is going through these types of experiences and they try to think their way out of it, like I know I was trying to reason my way out of the way I was feeling and I couldn't break through that. Is that the reason because the thinking brain is shut down? That's a part of it, Joan. There's a couple of reasons. When you have significant enough traumatic events, part of what happens is your foundational belief about yourself and the world changes. So you start to believe the world isn't safe, really bad things happen, or you start to believe really bad things happen to me, or I deserve these things to happen. And once those foundational shifts start happening in the brain, those are the first places to start. And um, 
there's three different phases to trauma processing. This goes back to Judith Herman's book, Trauma and Recovery. So a large part of the first stage of therapy is establishing safety. How can you actually start to believe that the world could be a safe place after you've been through significant experiences, whether that's losing people that were important to you, surviving a natural disaster, um, those kinds of events really shift our worldview. And trying to believe that the world could be safe is something that's really foundational to any kind of therapy. And that takes time. Mm -hmm. At first, it feels, especially if you're trying to do it through a thought-based way, trying to tell yourself a new story, it feels like you're gaslighting yourself. So one of my first TikToks that went viral was explaining the difference between affirmations and affirmations. So an affirmation would be, good things happen to me, I deserve love, home is where the heart is. And those kinds of things can be really beautiful and affirming to some people. But for people who've been through significant trauma, that can feel like you're gaslighting yourself, like you're telling yourself lies. And even saying those words out loud can feel really uncomfortable in the body. And so I was teaching on TikTok something called affirmations, where you say those exact same phrases, but you just stick a what if in front of it. What if I deserve good things? What if the world could be safe? What if I could imagine a time in the future where I could feel safe in the world? And what you're doing is you're tiptoeing slowly towards that feeling of safety. And the more that you practice those kinds of, I call it planting seeds of possibility. Mm -hmm. You're planting seeds in your brain because once you've been through trauma, your brain preferentially goes to something familiar which is something dangerous or threatening. And if you start planting seeds of safety, eventually more pathways will be open to you. And that's all the opposite of trauma responses isn't being happy all the time or believing everything is safe. It's having flexibility, flexibility in your responses, flexibility in what you believe, flexibility in your anticipation about future events. So many of us, when, when we're going through these challenges, we beat ourselves up because we think we should be able to, quote unquote, snap out of it or move past it. And that only adds to the stress cycle that you just described. And so I love when you talked about the what if, because then that opens the door for post-traumatic growth. And so would you explain to our listeners what that is? Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to say something really quick first is the first step in trauma recovery is always self-compassion. People are constantly feeling shame about their own trauma responses. And so I'm always explaining to people that everything your mind-body system is doing, it's doing to protect you. So we always kind of feel badly about, well, why is my nervous system doing this? I'm avoiding things I should be enjoying, or I'm hypervigilant, always anticipating bad things to happen. And I say, yeah, your nervous system is really working hard to protect you, isn't it? And post-traumatic growth is when you're coming out on that other side with self-compassion, having recognized those protective mechanisms for what they are as really important survival strategies. And we recognize the way our nervous system and our thinking patterns are trying to protect us. And post-traumatic growth is a different baseline than resilience. So a lot of people talk about resilience these days, and I have this beautiful illustration in my book where resilience is how you bounce back to your baseline, and post-traumatic growth is when you exceed your baseline, when you recognize new things about your place in the world and how the world works, and you're showing up with a different level of compassion for yourself and others, and a lot of times people who've been through significant trauma develop um, a need for service on the other side of it. How can I help others? Mm -hmm. So coming out on the other side of trauma can look like a brand new baseline, a new understanding of the world and a new understanding of our place in it. And that doesn't happen for everybody. A lot of people are just trying to survive and they're really stuck in those survival modes because, you know, their basic needs aren't being met, whether that's the need for, um, financial security, food and housing. It's a lot of the people that I work with. Um, and then sometimes it's relational needs. And if they can't feel safe in relationships and establish a sense of trust and safe boundaries, then those needs need to be met first. 
But post-traumatic growth, I really believe, is possible for all people. Do you think, in, in what you just described, in my life, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing had I not gone through all of those challenges, and I found purpose in service. Do you think finding some type of purpose from what you've experienced, do you think that helps with the healing process and moving forward? I really do. I mean, I think humans are designed for connection and meaning. I think that's the fundamental purpose of a human life. And connection doesn't necessarily have to be traditional relationships. A lot of people think that has to mean, you know, your spouse or your children. For some people, connection might mean nature or a pet. And I really don't want to define that connection for any one purpose or person because it really does look different. And the same thing goes with purpose. So for a lot of people who've been through significant trauma, you included, you're the embodiment of it. And for me, it really started when I survived the earthquakes in Nepal in 2015. And I started to recognize how traumatic the job as an inpatient hospital physician working 80 hours a week was on my body. You know, I really started to wake up to a lot of traumatic events that were happening to me relationally and professionally. And I started to recognize how much it had affected me. And just like you, it started to make me realize there's a lot of good that I could do by helping other people understand this um, and be of service. And for some people, their meaning or their ikigai, like that place where you're finding something that you're passionate about and it's something that the world needs. And it might be forming, you know, a small garden in your backyard where you feed a couple of your neighbors. That could be something really significant that comes out on the other side of it because you realize, well, gardening really calms my nervous system down. Mm -hmm. And then that grows into something, pun intended, that feeds a lot of other, a lot of other people. So that purpose orientation can look very different for lots of people but I do find that for people who've been through significant trauma and they're starting to understand how that shapes us and our experiences sharing what they've learned brings Mm -hmm. a lot of people meaning on the other side of trauma. And doesn't focusing on something like you mentioned gardening something that brings you joy makes you happy doesn't focusing on that for maybe a minute two minutes I don't know what the actual time is but doesn't that create new neural pathways in the brain? It really depends on each person so um, what we're trying to do is to create more experiences in parasympathetic, which is your calm nervous system, Mm -hmm. when you're feeling safe and connected. So parasympathetic can also go into overwhelm. And that looks like can't get out of bed, can't get off the couch. So what you're looking for is that safe and calm nervous system response. So for some people that could be gardening, for some people that could be, you know, petting their cat or sitting in front of a crackling fire, Um, Deb Dana, she's one of the clinicians involved in the polyvagal theory, which is something that I really ascribe to clinically. She talks about it as glimmers. So when we start to notice the triggers, what are the kinds of things that, you know, bring us back to a physical or emotional state that's uncomfortable? We also want to amplify the glimmers or the physical and emotional states that are beautiful and awful and connected. And I think the way that our human brains work, we are programmed to recognize negative aspects, five to one ratio, because we're trying to protect our body from threat. What we want to do is to amplify those glimmers and those positive interactions and those times when our nervous system is feeling calm and connected. Yeah. And so the goal then is to become more mindful of what we're feeling. Deb Dana describes it as befriending your nervous system. And really the ultimate goal of my book was to give people personalized tools where they can say, wow, this really makes my brain body feel calm. And we're just looking for those micro moments. Mm -hmm. When you've been through significant trauma and your nervous system is stuck in those fight, flight, freeze states, what would it look like to just touch base and create some calming delta waves in your nervous system using self-touch or havening? So that's something I describe in the book. I talk about self-acupressure or tapping. That's called emotional freedom techniques. If you have an emotion like anger or sadness or grief that's showing up at like a 10 out of 10 and you're so dysregulated and you just can't function, 
you can use a tool like tapping just to bring those levels down to like a five where you feel like you can cope with your day-to-day routine. So there's lots of different tools that a person can learn. We've talked about at least six of them so far in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I wanted to bring to people's attention is there's ways to induce your parasympathetic nervous system and feel more calm. There's ways to calm the brain down and create delta and theta waves that are really, really calm and relaxing. And you can DIY, DIY that yourself even without a therapist, although that helps too. And what would be a warning sign? What are some of the signs that we may need more help? Well, I mean, I think a lot of people have um, symptoms of post-traumatic stress without necessarily having full-blown PTSD. But PTSD is a function of four different symptoms. Um, Those are hypervigilance, when you're feeling like you're constantly on edge waiting for a shoe to drop, always anticipating bad things happening. Some people might actually be really jumpy. So if like a door slams or someone's you know, crying, they, they really start to feel panicky and anxious. Um, intrusive symptoms, so intrusive, it means flashbacks, nightmares, bad dreams, can't sleep because that story you're telling yourself or an experience you're reliving is just constantly interfering and the past is showing up in the present. Um, avoidance, so not being able to do the things that you should be doing or want to be doing in the day. And that could even be the people that you care about, but just really avoiding any situation that could be triggering and then eventually it becomes just avoiding life altogether and that's when the negative beliefs about the self and the world really start creeping in from a nervous system perspective fight and flight that's locked into the body feels like tension feels like irritability feels like constantly agitated and restless and an overactive calm nervous system feels exactly how i mentioned is just that can't get out of bed, can't get off the couch, feeling stuck and frozen and just not able to do the things that you're supposed to do to, to, to be living your life in a successful way for you. Mm-hmm. So any of that would be an indicator that things are locked in and you need to um, learn your own patterns in terms of what's locked in and then learn ways to shift. And that looks different for each person. The book is The Modern Trauma Toolkit, Nurture Your Post-Traumatic Growth with Personalized Solutions. Dr. Gibson, where can our listeners go to get more information about you and your work? Thanks for that. So on TikTok, I'm TikTok Trauma Doc. The book website is moderntrauma.com, which has all of the links to purchase the book in the U.S., U.K., and Canada. And to find out more about me in terms of speaking engagements or just to get in touch, I'm at christinegibson.net. And once again, that website is christinegibson.net. Thank you so much for joining us. I would love to have you come back on. I could talk to you for hours. Yeah, I feel the same way. You've got great questions and your own experience is so insightful, Joan. Thank you for joining us. I hope you found the show informative. At Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, we believe that knowledge is power. Take what you've learned, apply it, and live your best life now. Remember that the information provided is the opinion of our guest and should never replace the advice of a professional who knows your personal situation. If you'd like more information, visit our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on our site, listen to past shows on demand, read the digital magazine, sign up for our mailing list, and be sure to follow the show on social media. Until next time, this is Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.